patients and we are ready to start the June 19th policy committee meeting. Um, introductions wise, I'd like to just same old crew here. We are missing two of our, <laughs> they'll be here soon. Yes, two of our compatriots, but maybe there's a line in the men's room, I don't know. Um, but we're happy to have Joanna Vines here, our student representative, and Andrew McHenry, our teacher representative, and Susan, and our superintendent, Dr. Rabarczyk, and our solicitor. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rabarczyk to make his administrative remarks for the evening. Sure, so I am going to start with uh, the questions from our last meeting because we didn't get to um, the April 17th meeting. We didn't get to share those last, those last meeting. Basically, I'll go through them quickly, but um, there was a suggestion the district needs a policy for the privacy of all data collected about students to be used for educational purposes. I did meet with my, uh, Mr. M Dr. McCook as well as Mr. Augustine, our tech department, and they informed me of the different things that we use to utilize that, that privacy piece um, in regards to following FERPA, going, uh, following the COPA law, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of 1998, as well as our own board policy. So we do have a number of things in place um, and that we will continue to strive to look at other options when we're looking at children, uh, the privacy of our students. The suggestion was made about the district having uh, policy titled to district initiated real, real estate tax assessment appeal. And just saying that I talked to Ms. Deco and the district will take this suggestion under consideration. The suggestion was made the district looked at revisiting properties whose assessments would reduce during turn down in the market. And again, the district appreciates the suggestion to revisit and spend uh, the reduced assessments during the turn down in the market. It needs to be careful when looking at individual parcels for reassessment to ensure it will not be considered a spot assessment, which is not permissible by law. Um, there was a question about the board reviews and administrative regulations. And we, simply, the board does not approve or adopt accompanying administrative regulations, but they are presented to the policy committee for review, and the board is informed when they're posted to the website. In regards to the question about field trip policy and finance, on, on trips, they were responded to at previous meetings. The most recent response to the question can be found in the minutes from our April policy committee meeting and board docs. And then our May 8th meeting, there were a number of comments and questions regarding the May policy, um, policy meeting where the reference to booster clubs. Um, as you're aware, today's meeting, a draft of the version of the booster clubs policy in the air will be presented for the first time. So following today's presentation, the administration will receive, review the questions for the May committee meeting um, and address them at our August meeting at that time. So we'll go back to make sure anything we didn't cover. So we are presenting two, um, two policies today. One, the first one um, being booster policy, as we've talked about booster clubs, which we've talked about for some time in regards to the timeline and our communication plans. Um, there are updates on the website under the booster club um, webpage, but basically we're looking at the draft of the policy and an AR for the very first time this evening, just really to begin to gather feedback from the committee, from the public um, as well, and be able to take that information and go back over the summer and continue to develop that um, policy and AR. And then the second one is policy 231, class trips and social events, which we're looking to propose of um, implementing and adopting a policy that will take place at 231 called 121.1 other student trips. And the reason for this is the policy, um, last year we adopted the revised policy of 121, which was curriculum related field trips. This policy in turn will, gov um, will go ahead and cover any other trips that students take, so that are non-curricular in, in, in statute. So we will move forward with looking at that policy to determine whether or not it encompasses all other trips beyond the curriculum related field trips and we'll cover um, the process for that. Um, the three policies under communication, just to note, were um, removed from our website. Those were the two that were, the three that were rescinded based on our communications policy, AR. Um, so those three have been removed, 901, 902, and 911. And furthermore, we had three new policies in May that were passed and as we were looking to put them onto the website, we took a step back. We're, we're going to be transitioning to board docs for all post new policies. So that's going to be the first of the post to board docs. We just didn't feel like putting it on the website and then 
two weeks later transitioning it to four docs. All right. Great. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Dr. Rabarczyk. Um, let's move into public comment. Is there any public comment this evening? <laughs> I said it's so nice to say evening and see the sun, sun is still out. shining. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. Um, Spurl. That's your mic. Oh, I thought by on the sun on it, it yeah. almost looked like he's yeah. looking at the sun. Thank you. Uh, I had a question on the policy 231, which is the one that's being replaced by 121 and 121.1. And that was a definition of student social image, which isn't even mentioned on 121. Does that mean that there won't be anything covered? In other words, I, usually there's a definition on the policies, a line that says definition. And I was just curious as to the definition of student. I understand class groups, but it seemed to me there was something new to me about social events. Protests, marches, that, are those the type of things you're talking about? Notice that it's being totally eliminated in 121.1. I don't know if it was covered in 121. We don't have a copy here. Um, it's great to finally see the booster club policy after a long period of time and asking when it will happen. A couple questions on the AR. Uh, and that's just quick questions. There are attachments mentioned, but there weren't attachments. Attachment A for uh, as guidelines for bylaws for the booster club. And then there's an attachment B, which was mentioned in the AR. Um, Ms. Spurl, I can clarify that quickly. Um, we didn't want to put the cart from the horse, so we really wanted to get through the policy in the AR before defining those okay. attachments to make sure that's exactly what was going so to transpire. No there's no attachments yet. They're, they're draft ones, but based on any recommendations or revisions to this, we didn't want to have to recreate everything all over again. Okay, thank you. And one other question, and that's on page two of six, under membership slash meetings on the Booster Club, the first, uh, one, two, third paragraph, the following individuals are not eligible for membership in Booster Club. And the first one, to me, does not make any sense. Um, and they, um, Students eligible to participate in sport, in the sport or activity of that booster club. I could understand if they are participating in that sport or activity. They may not be, but students eligible to participate, so if that could be explained. Thank you. If I'm reading it correctly, Okay, thank you very much for those comments. Any others? chart for the district being changed and if so doesn't that require board approval three how long must a club sport exist and have reasonable participation before the district will fund it fairly that was a question left over from before and the booster policy are all coaches hired and employed by the district including club sports I'm not sure about that and um, I wondered about that with the definition of coaches as district employees. So maybe they all are hired individually. I just like to ask that question about it. 
related to the booster administration regulations, second sentence needs an ed edit in the bylaws section. Uh, under membership meetings, why can't students and employees also attend, along with coaches, booster club meetings, even though they are not members? Sort of implies with the comment there that coaches can attend meetings, but they are, you know, they can't be members of the committee. I don't see why students who are participating can't attend booster meetings. Maybe they have something to contribute to decisions made by the boosters. If, if the booster clubs do not comply with district financial disclosure request, will this lead to a revocation of this booster club's function in district activities as stated in the policy? Because the, boost, the football boosters have not been um, submitting their financials for the Title IX forms. And so I'm wondering if they don't comply, will that mean that they'll their uh, function will be revoked. Under fundraising and fees, is there any requirement that a booster club be transparent in its financials with its members? Fees, are parents required to pay the fee? That's not clear. It is clear in the um, regulation that if you have a financial burden, you can you know, put your case forward and even the district might cover the cost or something, but what if you just don't want to pay the fee? Do you have to pay a fee? Um, and finally, number 10, under improvements to district buildings and grounds, request to the board must be made in a timely manner to ensure that the board will have adequate time to deliberate, deliberate prior to making a decision at a public board meeting. I think the word publicly should be included there, adequate time to deliberate publicly prior to making a decision in the public board meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Good evening. Good evening. Is this on? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, Rick Eckstein from Garrett Hill. I'm here to mostly address the the Booster Club issue, just as, as a reminder, uh, for some of you I've been uh, researching and writing about in sports for, for five or six years now, and uh, so we'll, we'll offer some uh, suggestions. These are not based on anything that has happened locally, any resemblance to events that are real or imagined in Radnor or coincidental. Um, these are offered in good spirit. I've, I've lost my last daughter to graduation. And I promised Mr. Bechtold I would say that graduation went lawlessly this year, except for the, <laughs> except for the potholes on Gerard Avenue. You know, so. We have those on Lancaster too. Well, I'd appreciate it if you do something about that. So the, the, if, do you know somebody in the to take care of those things? You know, yeah, right. That's, we're really good on construction there, so that should be no problem. Um, the, the comments I'm going to make more or less focus, they focus more on sports, but I, I want, I'd like you to think of them as more general also and, and could apply to other extracurricular activities. And, and they're offered more, again, as a, almost as a flare of things that I've discovered in uh, doing this research over the last few years uh, and offer them a good faith to the district so perhaps they can avoid uh, some problems that I saw with other schools uh, across the country. Uh, first, I think it's important to distinguish between those sports and activities that are fully subsidized by booster club and those that are funded by the school, uh, whether they be PIAA or not. Uh, there's a real different dynamic for, say, a crew team or an ultimate frisbee team. Uh, Mary Sotheby was here last month to talk about the squash team. Uh, those are fully funded. Bales would not exist without the support of the boosters. They do not receive any significant funding. From, from the school. So the dynamic there on how money is raised, how it's spent, the decisions that are made, how decisions are made are different. I'm not saying they're better, I'm not saying they're worse, but they're very different. And a blanket policy dealing with both, uh, say, ultimate frisbee on the one hand and uh, lacrosse on the other, uh, maybe apples and oranges. And so it's just something to be uh, to sensitive to be sensitive about as these bylaws uh, are are, uh, are produced. Uh, secondly, well, also in terms of that, there's also a, a, 
possibility when you have an activity that's fully financed by a booster club, you run the risk of it turning into some kind of pay to play or pay to participate system where uh, the finances and the requirements to participate are just so uh, exorbitant because some things are expensive, ice time is expensive, uh, rowing shells are expensive, um, frisbees are not, but uh, other things may be. And that is just, it's not purposefully prohibitive, but just as a nature of the activity and that it's not subsidized at all by the school or by the district um, makes it prohibitive for some people to participate. Mr. Eckstein, I just want to um, ask you really quickly because I want to hear all of your comments, but we do have a four minute limit for commenter and trying to be consistent. If you can't make it in four minutes, would you move some of them to the final public comment so that we can hear them all, but still keeping within yeah, the Yeah, how am I doing with time? No, I, I honestly four? haven't been timing, but I am mindful of time. You have about one minute. I thought it was 20 seconds. It goes by really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it goes by really quickly. <laughs> but, but, and I just want to hear all of your comments. It sounds just the, like the my students say, oh, there's no classes over. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we do want to hear them, but just trying to be fine. consistent well, in the application. I'll, I'll do the second one now, okay. which is general. I'll save the more specific ones for later. And I had to do with Title IX, because I know Chuck, you brought something up. I watched the tape uh, of last month's meeting about Title IX. I think there was some misunderstanding about the impact of Title IX. Uh, there was a there was an amendment to Title IX in 1974, the so-called Javits Amendment, which uh, pretty much ruled that uh, resources were not part of the consideration of compliance. I, I, I find that disheartening, but the reality is that, that Title IX compliance is mostly about participation and opportunity, not about resources. I know Chuck, you brought up the thing with football. Yeah. Um, and, and we're having a discussion with the solicitor. And I'm not defending that law, but that seems to be how the law has evolved, that it's about slots and participation, not about resources. And, and the law was amended to, with football in mind because it's so expensive and you know, I don't want to defend that, but that's something I thought you might want to think about. So I'll, I'll come back later. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your understanding and we'll look forward to hearing from you. I again. appreciate it. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, let's uh, approval of minutes. Committee, anybody have questions or concerns about the minutes? There, there's one commenter that I just want to change the spelling of their name. The second public comment, Steve Sherry, is yes. S C H E R I. And let's move on to the agenda item number one, which is going to be the policy 231 social events and class trips as it's currently entitled. Correct. So the policy that we're introducing tonight, policy 121.1, other student trips, it would take the place of policy 231 social events and class trips. The reason for this was the content of the policy will govern all student travel beyond the curriculum related field trips. So and in, that, in addition, the sequential order of these policies are going to allow for easier reference as you're going through and looking for the trips that students take, whether they're curriculum related or other student trips that we believe in regards to any other trip they may take while they're in, within the district. So I will okay. take any comments. Okay, so let's start. Susan, it looks like you have your finger on the button there so uh, my only question is what's going to happen with the category called social events are you going to leave that as policy 231 and eliminate so uh, let me just back up by saying I think this is a really good decision to put student trips right behind curriculum based student trips it, 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 I've been advocating for this for quite a while um, I think the placement of it in the 100s is correct. Um, I think that um, I have some other comments, but I'm not going to get into it. it. The policy is good. I think it's good. It, do, it does not address social events, i.e. classroom parties. And the kind of the cover letter that we received was that everything that's in policy 231 is now covered by other policies. And so if it is so, that social events is covered by a different policy in our policy manual. I'd like to know what policy that is. And I would, I would say, I'll tell you, I don't think that it is, but I could be wrong. And so my suggestion would be to keep 231, but bring it back as just social events. I think class trips, you know, travel that's not curricular based 
still belongs in the 100s. And uh, we might need to just take a quick look at, at keeping 231 as 231, but only called social events. Unless you have the answer for me of where social events, i.e. classroom parties, is covered under some other policy. So policy 231, uh, as you can probably guess, was a PSDA policy. Yes. If you look at the language of it currently, to me, it's very vague. Yep. It's not very clear what it addresses. There are some social events that arguably are trips. They may not be class trips, and they may not be field trips, but they could be social trips. Um, you know, the senior class trip every year is a class trip that comes to mind. Um, but there are some other items that many may think of as social events that are trips. And do they fall under 231? Do they fall under a different policy? Uh, who knows under the, the, the current framework that we're working with? It's a question for the committee as to whether you want to have a policy on in-school social events. So an ice cream social that takes place during the school day in the school building. That's a question for the committee as to whether you want to have a board policy that governs that or whether that's just something that takes place in the normal operation of the school day. The items that are trips that are social in nature have clearly been moved to 121.1. And there's a catch-all definition in 121.1 that says any travel or any trips that is not part of 121 is now part of 121.1. Okay. So anything that's off school grounds essentially will be covered by either 121 or 121.1. The remaining question, and it's certainly a question for the committee to discuss, is whether you feel that there's a need to retain a policy on social <coughs> events that take place during school. So that's an excellent, thank you, for because that really is the essence of it. Was that the case in Unionville? Is it typical? Because it's in school. So that's what you meant when you said everything else in 231 is covered by other policies. What you were really, I didn't, I didn't clean that from what you said, but what you're really saying is if it's on school property, they're covered by other policies because they're covered by other policies. So we don't really need a policy that says social events if it's on Okay, um, not only on the school day, but on school property. So for instance, prom as a class, prom will be an other student trip or an other, it's another social event because they travel off campus. What, where's, what's prom? Under this definition, what's prom? And what's post-prom, which is held on school property? Prom would be a school-sponsored probably a school sponsored activity of some sort, participation in some sort of school. Is it a student trip? They travel to it. But they travel on their own. That's my point, that's why I'm asking about prom. Post prom's back at the school, and a post prom right. party is covered under anything else that's on our school property, correct? Yes. Yes. Prom, what's prom? Not a field trip, not curricular. They, they bring themselves to it. So I guess what I would ultimately say, Ed, is if you have an answer for how's prom, what's prom, then that answers the question of whether or not we need 231 okay. for me. And, and prom could arguably fall under 121.1. 121.1 is not so prohibitive uh, to comply with that it would be hard <coughs> to put prom under. It just it really just requires superintendent or designee approval and there's some items that you know may need to be provided I imagine those things are already taking place I imagine the superintendent whoever is designated to be responsible for prom somebody is responsible for who's attending uh, yeah, but do we, I don't place. believe that we give I don't believe that parents are asked to give written permission to attend prom okay but it's not like a field trip of any type where we're going what about to the seat. freshman semi and the so though so my answer to your question and my answer to the committee is is if is if we're very clear that we have social events that go on so classroom party classroom parties are during I the think, school day I during the school, school day it's those events that happen outside of the school day that we're not asking for parent permission necessarily kids buy a ticket I don't I don't ever remember and I'm not saying that that's wrong or bad it was technically covered under. 231 if we get rid of 231 where are prom high school dances 
um, both on and off campus, but outside of the curricular day covered. I can go ahead and take a look at our policy. And, as, and by the way, that doesn't change for me that I think 121 is a very good policy. I just wouldn't take the immediate Social. step right now to eliminate 231. I would say that we should either have my, my, those questions that I'm asking answered or keep it but amend 231. And I can look at both of those. Thanks. Susan, is, yeah. there, is there anything in particular in 121.1 that you think prom doesn't correspond to? Yes, we don't ask for parent permission in the thir under the guidelines. Um, permission of the parents or guardians must also be sought and obtained in writing before any student participates in the trip. Okay. I don't think, I'm, I'm happy to have a nod or a shake from Mr. Bechtold in the back. I don't think we get parent written permission for parent, for kids to attend prom. Right, so we don't get written permission for that. We don't get written permission for the dances. Now, I think we have all sorts of guidelines that say our students have, to, in the student handbook, we have a policy that says code. kids have to abide by all sorts of things. I just wouldn't, if we, if we eliminate 231, we all of a sudden have to get parent permission for kids to go to prom and to the freshman semi. That's all, the way it's written. We can look into that. Um, Andrew, did you have any other questions? No, that was it. Okay, before we move to Vice Chair, um, Joanna, given the student trips, any insights, something we're not looking at carefully enough? I don't think so. Okay, sure. Okay. And, and, and hang on, I just want to be clear that board, board doesn't have to give authority to any of these trips unless they are requiring, um, unless they're overnight trips. Okay. Other than that, it's the superintendent or his designees Correct. Authority. Okay, thank yep. you. Uh, Mrs. McMenamin. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm good. I'm good. Adrian? You look like you want to be silent. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, Susan, I think that was a good clarifying question that you asked. So thank you for asking that. And that gives us something to think about going forward for 231's uh, action. Um, I don't have any questions on 121.1 other than uh, at this point would the committee be comfortable with moving this forward for a first read next week at our business meeting yes okay but would you, would you oh i'm sorry chuck i about <laughs> you i'm so sorry <laughs> I was, were you thinking of possibly putting something in 121.1 specific towards prom or anything like that or are you comfortable with moving this and then doing the prom with some some other policy? I would say we're comfortable to going forward with this is the other student the other student trips and, you're and then do something with the like you said keeping 231 okay. and reframing it with the social events kind of aspect with prom and those okay. kind of okay. features. Then I'll go with that. Okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. All right. So um, we'll move on let's proceed then. 121.1 is on the agenda for next week. Okay, super. Then let's move to the just next. A, just to clarify, yes, I'm sorry. Are, is 231 being moved forward for repeal for a yeah. first read? I don't think but we yeah. should. No, you can, you can always do a repeat if you need to, but leave it for now. So in other words, because we're changing the number and changing the title, I'm getting a little confused. So what we're putting forward next week is 121.1 for a first read and we're not talking about 231 at all is that the way it'll work correct right right now correct. is the way it stands on our agenda we have 231 as the agenda item ne at next week the agenda item will be 121.1 it won't say 231 no it will not okay. so i'm gonna yeah what i would say is to be technical i guess i would propose amending our our, our we have a committee recommendation and I would propose amending the recommendation to not move 231 and we title it into 121.1, but rather just put forth 121 for a first read as a new policy Correct. and then let's them let them figure out what makes the most sense with regard to the social events I just mentioned. Okay, I think Mrs. McManaman, hold the mic. She yeah, good. Let's see the peanut gallery over there. It's not peanut. <laughs> well, okay, my question is when you look at 231 and 121.1, I think the biggest difference is 121.1 adds permission. 231 doesn't say anything about parent permission. Right. 
there's the big difference right. between the two. They're saying the same thing, so one says parent permission, one doesn't. Right. That's the reason I think it can stand as just being renamed as social events and it will cover prom. Yes. But that's unless you guys tell me that prom is covered under some other policy and we don't need 231 anymore. It's exactly my point. That's the big difference. Yes. Yeah. Are there any um, social events for which parent permiss parent permission is sought? I'm thinking of, for example, I don't know if we still do it, that fifth grade party over at the College, but that's a trip. That's during they travel. school they days. Right, well, right, right, right. Yeah. They travel. And that's they need a parent permission. Oh wait, prom they travel. They don't travel. They don't get travel. Right. They don't travel with transported us. by us. Right. Okay. But is there any other that you can think of where permission is needed for? Mr. Beckel, can you think of any other one that you would? Like our son, on we're talking the back. And we weren't sure if the band ball if that would. So the band ball is another example of what I think will be a social event. Is there permission? No, there's not. That's in, that's Mrs. McManaman's point is that we have a number of events and things that occur that we don't need the kids to have parent permission. I mean, not written permission, not written permission. The point of creating student trips was to distinguish those times that students travel under district transportation and we do ask for permission, but it's not curricular. And the distinction there is when it's a curricular related field trip, students have different rights about attending and things like that than they do if it's just a student trip. And that's one of the reasons, it makes it very clear in 121.1 that it is not, it's a privilege, right. not a right. And that's the reason that I, I felt strongly we needed, needed to make a distinction between curriculum related field trips and other student trips. And both of those are separate from social events, which I don't really think social events, I didn't know in the, then initially there was a contemplation of getting rid of social events. I personally think social events is still a needed policy because we practically speaking still have those things occur in our district. The middle school, there's social events. Um, you know, at the high school, there's a whole number of them. So okay. off campus, after hours, Okay, Thanks. so why don't, so for next week, we're going to put forth for first read 121.1. When we come back for a second read, maybe it makes sense to have 231 come back as a modified policy that just speaks to social events, unless you find some hiccups in that along Correct. the way. Does that make sense? So we can mm -hmm. just keep this moving. Moving. Yes. Exactly. Okay, yep. terrific. Thank you very much. Um, Without, so I think now we're ready to move on actually to our second and final agenda item, which is policy, excuse me, 915 booster clubs. Um, first, you were going to maybe pull up on the screen, I think, Mr. Berserk, oh, yeah. just our, our page. And, and, and as I do that, just prior, I just want to um, publicly, I want to <coughs> recognize Mr. Bechtel and Mr. Friel for all the work they've done on this to make sure that we encompass and we put into this policy and the AR, that feedback that was initially received from the booster club reps, because that was really important in regards to guiding how we move forward. And they did a wonderful job of talk, you know, working with all those individuals and understanding what the needs of the organizations were. So thank you, Mr. Bechtel and Mr. Friel. Um, yes, and, and I also want to extend a thank you to the rest of the administrative team, because just about every other administrator uh, was involved in this because it's a comprehensive policy and so it's really been a collaborative effort between among communications and, and the business office and and uh, Mr. Dr. Rafarczyk and our superintendent and the booster clubs themselves because their feedback was absolutely critical to informing what has become the first draft so without their input um, it would have been much more of a struggle so I want to make sure that we acknowledge them as well um, Mr. Bechtel, do you want to join us up here in case there are questions, or do you are you comfy back there? I don't want to. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Okay, thank you very much for coming up. And Dr. Rabarchik, do you want to walk us through, or do you want any other remarks, or do you want the committee to start to give some feedback? So why don't we move into? I think everyone has seen it; it's been posted. So why don't we move right into the feedback? Okay, terrific. So let's. Uh, how about we start over this way, Dr. Bassett? Do you have any feedback for us? I don't. Okay, well then how about Susan, do you have any? I do. Okay. Um, I think the policy is very well written. Thank you. 
I don't think that all coaches are district employed. I think that there are booster clubs. And I thought that Mr. Eckstein's distinction was a really important one, which is going to lead into my actual comment. Um, I'm not positive that all coaches of all teams, particularly some of the club sports, are actually district employed. Now, I could be mistaken about that, and I'm happy to be corrected. Yeah. And maybe they are district employed, but funded by booster clubs. Okay, so, right. so I think that we have to be careful in our definition of coach, because I believe that some of our coaches are coaches of our students at the club sport level, but they are not paid for by the um, district. I'm not sure of the implications with regard to this policy, but I believe that that is the case. So I have a little bit of a, cons that's my feedback, and I'm glad this isn't going for first week tonight. I think the same is true for activity sponsors and advisors. I do not believe that all of our activity advisors of our club, of our club, our clubs are district employed. So that's one comment. I, I like the delegation. I'm okay with the guideline. Um, I am okay with the exclusion and the compliance. Um, I the, the AR needs a lot of work. I have a lot of concerns around the AR. I think that it is um, onerous in some areas. I think particularly with regard to the level of funding that some clubs get, or that some club sports get. To, to Mr. Eckstein's point, clubs that get virtually no funding from us, to me this seems like a very high standard of expectation. And um, we may need to rethink a little bit of that. Um, I did I did question some of the membership stuff with regard to students and parents and things like that. Um, that's really as much as I want to say about the, the um, about the AR. I, I think it needs work, but I but I like the policy okay. so far. So before we move on to more comments, I just want to give Mr. Bechtold a chance to comment if he has anything that he wants to weigh in on. No pressure, but if there's anything at this point um, that you wanted to say about the comments that Mrs. Stern made, or uh, and thank you for the work you no. did on it. Appreciate it. It was great to have the opportunity to, to get feedback from the booster clubs uh, and then uh, more closely uh, with the administrative group on this. So, um, you are correct that uh, under the definition of a coach, we have a number of coaches that are, um, that are district paid, but then we also have coaches that are outside. And I can totally speak for the high school level of this policy. It's all, you know, obviously district wide. Um, at the high school level, I'm not aware of an activity sponsor or advisor that is not paid by the district. However, I'm going to come back to this is a district policy, so other other buildings may have things set up differently. So mm -hmm. I think that those are, those are an easy fix. Um, um, you know, I will look at, so one of the comments that I heard uh, was on page two of the membership uh, and meetings as to individuals not eligible for membership in booster clubs. Um, you know, one of the things that was brought up was students eligible to participate in this board activity. Uh, this actually came uh, from uh, Mr. Diazio when, when that was one of the first things I asked is why do we have this in here? Um, you know, the goal is for students to be able to participate. They're the, you know, they're the people that are eligible to participate. Uh, we wouldn't want to have someone that is uh, a senior in, in high school that is going to be on the soccer team that says, I'm going to run to be the president of the soccer booster club. Um, and as silly as that sounds, um, you know, students eligible to participate in a particular sport, my understanding is that this is in there, so we don't have people that are active participants that are also running the booster club at the same time. I, I wonder, Mr. Giazio, given that, if it would have been students who are actively participating in the sport or activity. So you could be a senior, you could be eligible to play in soccer, but you're not. Should you be ineligible to be the soccer booster club person, to, to use Mr. Bechtel's example, versus a student who is actively participating in that sport, they shouldn't be the booster club um, president. That makes a ton of sense to me. So it might be a minor distinction, and I think a lot about the AR should probably get discussed. Kind of, we should 
I, we don't have to answer tonight because it's the AR portion. Sure. Correct. Um, but that's that's a pretty in, interesting distinction to make that Dan just made. The only other thing I would add to that is usually when people think of a booster club, they think of an organization of parents and parents' guardians. Usually you don't think of students running that type of club. Uh, that might be through a student organization where you would organize that way to support a district um, program or activity. But usually boosters are thought of as groups of uh, parents or guardians. But we can certainly look at that if there's a desire to amend that. Okay, and I wasn't hearing that it be amended completely. It was just the the, the wording students eligible to participate um, would be confined a little bit more to students who are participating, right? Or something like that. Well, yeah, I think what, I guess the best way for me to say what I think about the AR is that I thought the intention of the AR was to provide just to try to find the balance between a good structure that would be best practices and that would be recognizing the district's legal responsibility across a variety of uh, topics, but not to be onerous. And this six page AR seems bump. No, so it's more like a, um, so it's, I, I, it, I would want to give this a little bit of a, just kind of a whole different kind of thought, that's all. Okay. Um, Joanna, Mrs. McMenamin. So the, the, the comment about a definition being in here was brought up. Would it be make sense to put a definition in um, under membership and meetings? Thus, the, the, the reason why those people are not eligible would be better understood of what being self So a definition for membership, what defines uh, membership? What does membership in right. the booster what, club mean? I think that's a good idea. That or what the booster club is, and then it would help like when you just first look at this, that doesn't make sense why these people aren't part of it. But that explanation did. But I think if you had a definition, it would help clarify why some people are in and some people aren't. Good. Okay, so we'll make that as a note to add a definition of membership into that section. Um, Is that addressed by the definition of Booster Club itself? Oh, that's, you're coming to the question that I have yep, about that? Your turn. Okay. Well, my guess question would be what makes up at the different booster clubs because some booster clubs may need students to be on there they may or they may not there may be students already on some of the booster clubs i don't know um, each booster club they're different so for us to say this is a member of a booster club and we're defining it of what we see as a member of a booster club a generic booster club uh, one size might not fit all there's some of the people that were here, or what was it, the squash club that we have? Uh, maybe some of the people that do that and help out with that are students. I know with the, with the rabbit football, they may not be part of the club, but they do go out and promote, and they sell tickets, and they do this and that, which, I, which, which is great. Um, so I think we have to be a little careful of, of, of what we're doing. I also do agree with the booster club normally is thought of as as parents who were just mm -hmm. helping this out because the sports need it, the school's not sponsoring it, and different things like that. So before we put our own definition in here that's going to be the one for every booster club, I don't know, we have to, I, I would have to think a little bit more about that, or I think we should think a little bit more about that. Yeah. It's a good check. No, it's just looking around. Um, just about like student participation in booster clubs. The crew is very unique, so I don't really know. I might be mistaken, but so I'm a captain for next year, and I know that the captains have to go to the meetings, the board meetings, and at the board meetings, they discuss like fundraisers, all that kind of general stuff. So like, is, is this like saying that they can't go to those things, like what we have in place now? Like, I'm just a little confused. Well, with the yeah. student participation. That's why I think we're going to talk about the AR. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We're, just, we're just kind of being a little particular about yeah. the things. I just, cause I, yeah. Because I agree what you were saying about like the one size doesn't fit all. Right. Exactly. So, so. And there's definitely clubs where the students are an integral part of the fundraising that yeah. goes on. Yeah. 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 
So if membership is something that's defined by the ability to uh, cast a vote or something like that, <coughs> that, that it's, I think that's the kind of definition that we need. But again, that, that needs to be, that, that could be, I might like that in a football booster club and we get together and well, baseball doesn't like that. What are we doing here? Well, and really, the, the membership of each particular booster club right. is something that should be defined in the bylaws of the booster club. It, right. That's where I would agree with that. Okay. And, and so, really, that's where each individual booster club can be creative in terms of who's eligible to be a member. So, okay. in our policy, we would have that. I would agree to have that in our policy. That the definition of who can be a member of a booster club should be defined in their bylaws. There you go. Make that a kind of make right. A reference yeah. to it. Right. That I would so the definition of membership, if, you know, when you put membership, membership shall be defined as per each booster club's in respective bylaws. That covers that. I agree. Does that seem like a, a way to address that for people who have that concern? Well, you know, there are some. They have to maintain bylaws. I, I think that. Again, just looking at the policy itself, the policy is pretty bare bones. Mm -hmm. I think largely, I think that's a good thing. And I think that there's just a, a lot of consideration that needs to be put into the into the administrative regulation. And this was, I look at this tonight as this was a good, good, oh, what's this step? What's step? a right. good step right. in the mm -hmm. direction of, you know, doing what you're looking to achieve. And, it, you know, the powers that be may need to go back to the drawing board with some of the feedback that we're giving tonight and Andrea and Joanna and the public I mean everybody's given some some feedback to consider that was the point of tonight right and I think if there's additional feedback beyond tonight if you're thinking later tomorrow um, I would encourage members of the committee to email Dr. Yeah. Barczyk email Tony yeah. um, you know with that feedback because I think that is the, this is coming forward as you know the first discussion the first public discussion with it um, you know I think one of our public commenters you know, really hit the nail on the head with an issue that I think we are all struggling with is there is a very distinct difference between a booster club that is part of a PI AA. I'm going to use that because I think that's the clearest. Every district uses different terms to separate those things. We, we, we throw around the term varsity. Well, that doesn't do it for me, but that's the seems to be the term we use. But the distinction really is, is those teams that are that happen to be PIAA sanctioned and they are district sanctioned teams. We hire the coaches, we control those teams. Um, we are very involved in, in, in those programs. There are other programs where we say, you can be a club sport and then it is all different on those club sports on who's, what type of financial support they're getting. There's some real differences there. Well, Ken, just to even be a little bit more, because I think there's, there's PIAA there is club, there is district recognized and district funded. And those are two, that's really where the big difference is coming from because we have lots of recognized teams that are not particularly fully funded by the district. And so that's, you know, when you say sanction, I mean, all of our club sports are sanctioned. They're all recognized by the district, but it's whether or not they are in addition, are they funded and I believe all of our PIAA sports are predominantly funded by, you know, largely funded by the district. And I believe that with regard to the non-PIAA teams, some are and some are not. So in, in again, right? it's terms, it's terms that we all have to right. do because right. there is in, in, in my life in prior dicks and districts, there is, yes, we approve you to be a club sport, but right. we have no involvement with you. Exactly. We have no involvement with you and what you do is your own thing problem was when things went wrong and there was a problem with them somehow the high school principal and the superintendent of the board wound up owning the problems sure. um, because the parents then came to the district and said look at what's going on with this club I'll just okay. use an example that one that's common everyone has ice hockey I'm not picking on them but you kickball. know program kickball <laughs> um, so I do think that this is giving us some more food for thought about we need to really think about how we design this and what we and and to recognize that distinction. And obviously in recognizing that distinction brings up a whole lot of a host of other questions that we have about, are we happy with the status quo where we are? Um, or are there other things that we need to look at within that? Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
I just, I just, I just want to piggyback on that because I think that was a good point. Is maybe am I hearing that we may look at pulling out PIAA sports and their booster club and their booster club uh, policy, and or maybe within the same policy have one for the some of the other sports. So because looking at this and I agree with Susan some of the things for the for our club booster clubs we could be killing some of these uh, yeah. sentencing them to a slow death on the vine uh, and that's not what our purpose is here so to piggyback on what you're saying maybe we do want to look at the DIAA sport clubs booster clubs <coughs> a little confusing at times and then we'll have our booster clubs for the club sports and then we need to address this other group for us would be ice hockey which is a, which is a varsity sport may not be recognized by PIAA and I think it deserves to be funded by the school district I think we have done a disservice to the ice hockey program we and I was part of the group that voted it in to be a, to be a varsity sport and at that time a varsity sport I, I think I'm you voted speaking out of turn. Or I think you voted it in. I would say in my terminology, you voted in to be a club sport. No, no. 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 I'm sorry, no. but we did not. I uh, voted in personally. No. I voted in to be. A, we we had a gigantic varsity sport. It's a varsity sport. It was voted varsity. by the board to move it to a varsity. It was a club sport. Okay. And, and, and in that vote, did the school board decide to hire the coach? That I don't know. Because I, I would, I know these that. are where the this right. is where this is, so so if we need to look at we need to look at the I, I, I would agree. imagine with that vote, mm -hmm. if it's similar to other districts, mm -hmm. right. that the the board did not take on the hiring of the coach and running the hockey program. Is no, that no, accurate? I don't think we did. That, that, that was before my time. That we, yeah. we before our time. Yeah. Check we, the line. <laughs> I, I actually we, voted we on that, not. and it was recognized. So did Judy. At it was recognized as a varsity sport. Uh, so we need to go back and research that, but it was never funded. That's a big problem. And maybe we need to address that as we move forward with this. I, again, and I, don't, I want to be mindful of the timing. Mm -hmm. I do think that what we, what this is continuing to bring out that needs to be discussed at, not necessarily right here tonight, is that, you know, there is PIAA. Right. We do use the word varsity. That's not necessarily applied to PIAA sports, Ken. And, I actually have the photocopy of the minutes from that meeting. It was given to me by a member of the public. So I do know the exact meeting and I still have it. Um, but then, then, and that's all in the category of recognition. And then there is the category called funding. <coughs> and we need to, you know, there is some work to be done there about this conversation. Um, because the implication to your point is there are people who believe that when we recognize a sport as varsity, that it then follows, we will fund it. And those are not necessarily the same thing. And so, you know, that, and, but back to your point, recognized as a club sport or varsity sport or PAAA, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, when there's a problem, parents come to the high school principal and to the district looking for help and solutions. And we just need to understand and, and clarify as a district, you know, how we want that to go so that everybody is you know, following up to the middle school conversation we had in the curriculum committee meeting, people are looking for a clear communication of what they can expect. And when that's not clear, it, it creates a stress and a strain, and we don't need that. So we just have to clarify. And, and, and we were leaving out the category, too, of other, you know, programs that have booster exactly. clubs as well. Oh, yeah, right, right. And there's other programs, and those programs could both fall under school sanctioned or non-school sanctioned yeah. that have yep. booster clubs. So, no, I just think the, the, the point that is there, I think the attempt here at the, this policy was to try to do something that could cover all that we have. And I think it's now now that it's coming to a head here at a, a meeting, I think for me there's some questions and pause about the reality of the difference between these groups. Yep, right. So, so um, you know, a, a policy is only so good as its AR to be effective. So. I don't know if we need to slow down a little bit or if to any extent we're putting the cart before the horse. So we need to look into how we categorize our sports and activities and make sure we've got a handle on that before we start 
laying in some regulations around them? I'm not saying that this would take another year, but do you think administrative team and solicitor that that is something that would be helpful to us, that we've got to iron out our understanding of that before we move forward? Yes, so I, I mean, I think from tonight's meeting, there's been a great deal of feedback that's been given, and I think that feedback can be taken and continue to, to be worked on by the administrative team to bring back here. Okay, I think so, so. so we'll just make sure we get that piece ironed out, because if we don't have that, those ducks in a row, this policy in AR won't work either. So, okay, so why don't we sort of create that kind of focus for August is like the theme that we want to tackle more so than the nuts and bolts of should this be in, shouldn't this be in. Let's just get our, our ducks in a row that way. And, and maybe this policy will work fine to cover all those things and we will have to just identify that there are other areas that we need to look at to, mm -hmm. to straighten out. So it might be possible that, you know, that they, I know they have been, the group has been looking at that, looking at this, all the variation among our different booster clubs. So. We might be coming back that this policy works, but it's really then it's the AR right. that yep. we have to look at. Yeah. I, I always hesitate to put in, I think back to homework, for example. You know, if we don't have an AR, the policy doesn't help us, in my opinion, the, and as much. The policy really relies on the AR to be effective, to have, to have it, that, those, that's the actionable stuff that's in, in the AR. And, um, you had another comment because I'm trying to recall my question and it might take me a while so can you sure. ask <laughs> I, I have a very general comment which is that um, you know my, my youngest child my younger child turns three today happy birthday happy, happy birthday, birthday. Isabel. and then my and you're here talking about policy I know, I know. is she uh, watching uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah she should be she should be asleep okay. yeah. <laughs> and then my my older child Grant uh, uh, is finishing kindergarten Thursday. So all that to say, and uh, that's the family we just moved to Radnor three years ago. So all that to say that these distinctions may be relevant to me personally a few years down the road, but right now be, would be extremely helpful, I think, for, for me to learn about these distinctions. That we, and I think we'd be doing a, a great service to have them integrated into our policy or, or AR. Okay. And then thank you, because that helped me remember what I was Sure. Going to mention otherwise. And that is that what might help us get over the hurdle of whether something is onerous or not might be a, p a part of the conversation, which is why bylaws? Why officers and liaisons? I mean, that's something I think that may have taken place in the course of the, the team conversations about why, why a section on finances, why this, why that. Maybe we could uh, revisit some of that as we approach August and say, the reason why we're requesting that there be a copy of bylaws for every team is because it does this to protect the district and the club. And the reason why we put this in is to protect, do you understand where I'm going with that? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, think that, I think that that's really kind of essential. Otherwise, it's more of an arbitrary conversation about, well, this is too much or this is too little. Or well, yeah, and but I, I think there's some other work to be done even I before that. Maybe we need to take a pause too and <clears> that take a pause to really identify and be in agreement with what we have. I was not trying to make a slight at, at a team not being varsity no. or that, anything, that, but I think we all need to understand what we, what we, what we've done in the years to approve these teams and what that actually meant for those teams and what are they. I think that we all need to be on the same page with that. Okay. I, I think it should be in the policy, so there should be a definition of what these different teams are. BIAA, the other ones that the varsity ones, the clubs. I think that would be very beneficial. I think if yeah, we slow this down, basically. Yeah, but if we slow this down a little bit, and, and now we can allow the booster clubs who see this and might step forward and say, well, this is this would be my category, and this is what I think we could do in that category. It's not it doesn't really make sense to do some of these other things, so we can get feedback from the different groups such as you know the football booster club they they may be interested in continuing to do what they're doing and they already have all this stuff in place but the squash club may say you know can we streamline this a little bit for us because we don't have the same amount of parent support that we have or, or other clubs uh booster clubs so i think that this this gives everyone an opportunity to say well you know what we fit into this category 
and this is what we have to do. I think exactly. that would be better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and just a, a, you know, Dan and Mike have been having lots of conversations with the booster club. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, but I mean, so this we'll allows us to, to have more. Yeah. Happy summer. Um, Tony, on that page, you also have a list, don't you, of all of the booster clubs oh, now, right? Go back up. It's the welcome. Just one people to see right. where we are housing this information. So that's the list of identified booster clubs, a pretty comprehensive list of, so far. Mm -hmm. And you know that might be something at some point that could okay. be categorized for clarity once mm -hmm. we come up with those classifications. Great. But this is under the community section booster clubs for so thank you, because I know that I'm still working on getting that. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. Mike and Mike and I will yeah. look forward to working with Booster Clubs to get additional feedback on this. So Great, we thank you for your feedback. Thank you. Thank That's you very good. much. So um, unless, yes, I know. I just want to make sure from the committee, is there anybody who has any hanging out there comments? Okay. No hanging chat for me. No hanging chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then. And no new business, anybody? Okay, and then we'll go to our final public comment for the evening. Is there any public comment? I have mentioned repeatedly that um, ice hockey was voted as a varsity <coughs> sport, so I'll say it again. At the time it was both voted on by the board as a varsity sport, there was a committee that was made up of teachers, parents, administrators, coaches, um, and it was kind of a prestigious committee. You had to be kind of selected to be part of it. And this committee worked on different um, aspects of athletics and made recommendations to the board. One of the things that they worked on was a policy that um, showed a process by which a, bar, a club sport could become a varsity sport. And I don't know what happened to that policy. It's no longer, an ex I mean, I don't think it's part of our policy book anymore. But um, I think a process like that would also clarify to the people involved what steps were needed before they could be recognized. In this case, it was really an election, in one of the election issues to vote this team as a bar support. They were in every meeting. They were writing letters. It was a very strong issue at the time. So those of us who were, that were down, that were around at that point, have a very strong remembrance of this club, I mean, of this team <laughs> being a varsity sport. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, any other public comment? Mr. Oh, Mr. Eckstein. Sorry. I fell asleep. Mr. Beck, don't wake you up. Thanks. Thanks again for indulging me. Uh, a lot of the, I, I'm almost sorry to open up that can of worms before, but it's important and to throw another wrench in. Says about uh, being onerous on some of the teams that are not PIA sponsored. It's exactly those kinds of situations that you really have to be most careful about okay. because there's no accountability to educators okay. or overseers. And again, my experience in, in doing research on this is those are the clubs, those are the teams that get carried away. And that sometimes do, there's something going on in Conestoga right now, which you may or may not be aware of. You may be aware of it. Hint, hint. Uh, where a, a club sport did something really horrible to a student who wanted to attend graduation. And it is facing some consequences now from the district who didn't have any control over the situation or would have probably put an end to it uh, before it happened. A couple other points, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Bechtold told me I could send these in writing to, to he and to, and to Tony, and I'll, I'll do that. Uh, but the, the role of students, there seemed to be a lot of confusion about that, and, and I was confused also in reading uh, the documents because if, if students are fundraising for the booster club, are they members of the club or are they just uh, outsourced labor for, uh, and, and, and not to be flip about, there's, there's problems with that because is it voluntary or is it not? Can a student be, can a player be compelled to raise money 
and what does that money go for and how do those decisions how do the decisions how are the decisions made to spend money are they benefiting all of the players or all of the band members or all of the uh, Spanish club members or just particular ones do we use money to hire just a trombone coach or is it something that's used for all of the participants is the money raised used to subsidize just those people who might go on a trip even though not everyone might go on a trip or is it just to help subsidize an individual like with the band that the money raised by band members subsidizes their participation in the trips not other people's if they don't happen to go so there's there's a lot of nuance here that, uh, that probably needs to be hashed out in, in order to be fair uh, opting out as Ms. Sherry raised before if People choose not to participate in the booster club is there a way to do that without being stigmatized uh, without being perhaps facing punishment or retribution from coaches should coaches be involved in booster clubs or should they be excluded from it and it should be strictly parents uh, making decisions these are these are unanswerable right now uh, but they're, they're pretty important to, uh, to get to the weeds on this and I know you're spending your summer now uh, <laughs> doing that while the rest of us are at the beach or, or, or somewhere else. Uh, I'll get the rest of these into, uh, into, uh, into a note. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Comments. Oh, more public comments. We need to bust ahead. Your mic, yeah. Yes. You're on there. Um, just a quick comment, listening to all the discussions, uh, something to maybe consider is that clubs other than sport, I mean, booster clubs other than sports booster clubs, because of the discussion, you know, there's band, there's choir, there's whatever, orchestra, there's the ones that twirl the rifles, which I remember mean, that was called, um, which Patty's doing those things. But those seem to get lost in the discussion. Color guard, thank you very much. We get lost in the discussion. Is there something that, that needs to be pulled out of the discussion on other booster clubs? Because the whole discussion tonight was on sports. And I know there are other booster clubs. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments? No? Okay. Terrific. Then, um, we're adjourned. We're adjourned. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. All right, so see you in August. This committee will be meeting again in August. So we have an hour meeting. We'll just start in the Have a nice night. Great job. Thank you.